Hi, everyone, and welcome. Still seems like some people are still logging on and getting settled, so we'll give it just a few more minutes before we properly start. But in the meantime, I will cover a few of the housekeeping bits for our event today. Um, first off, no attendees will be visible or audible during the webinar, so you won't be able to speak to us, and we can't see you on this side of the panelist table, but you can ask questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, please submit any questions at any time during the webinar, and we will be synthesizing them and passing them on to the panelists when we move into the Q&A part of the conversation. Um, if you're an avid tweeter, social media influencer, or a member of a TikTok content house, our Twitter handle is at Ada Lovelace Inst. So you can tweet us there, and we'll be keeping the eye on the, on the conversation as it unfolds on social media. And if you'd like captions, we do have a transcri transcriber, I should say, doing uh, cl live closed captioning for us today. You can click the closed captions button at the bottom of the screen and pull those up. And finally, we are taking recording of today's public events, uh, which will be made available on our website. Great. Okay, I think we're getting pretty close to the number of, of participants that we are expecting to have. So um, let's probably start the event. Welcome everyone to today's public evidence events on the socio-technical challenges of designing and building a vaccine passport system. My name is Andrew Straits. I'm the head of research partnerships here at the Ada Lovelace Institute. For those of us who, or those of you who don't know, uh, we are a research institute based in London with the remit to ensure that data and AI work for people and society. This is the fourth public event we're holding in a series to rapidly explore the question of whether and how societies should use digital vaccine passports and other forms of health status applications. Our first event focused on the history of vaccine passports, our second on the potential epidemiological and economic impacts of these systems, and our third on the ethical considerations that these systems raise. You can find videos of these events available on our website, adalovelaceinstitute.org. The goal of these public sessions is to build evidence and profile different perspectives that will help us assess the impacts of digital vaccine passports and health status apps. And in the UK, the timing for this discussion could not be more urgent. Last week, we released a report concluding the rollout of digital vaccine passports are not currently justified while certain legal, ethical, and public health questions remain unanswered. The Royal Society also released a report that reached a similar conclusion. On Monday, the UK government announced the roadmap for loosening lockdown restrictions, part of which will include a review headed by Michael Gove into whether COVID status certification could play a role in reopening the British economy reducing restrictions on social contact, and improving safety. The review will consider the ethical, privacy, legal, and operational aspects of such systems, and what limits, if any, should be placed on organizations using certification schemes in the UK. Additionally, the government also promised in their roadmap to work with the WHO and other countries to adopt a clear international standard around the use of vaccine passports for travel. Undertaking this review, however, has apparently not stopped the government's plans to lay the foundation for such a system in the UK. On Wednesday, the government announced the NHS app will support COVID digital certificates, uh, allowing people to use their phone to prove that they have been vaccinated or have tested negative. And this is not unique to the UK. Countries like Israel and Switzerland are already in the process of implementing digital vaccine passport systems that will enable proof of testing and vaccine status. So too are private companies with firms like Salesforce and IBM offering tools to employers to check vaccine status of employees. And as you will hear today from one of our speakers, other countries like India are already um, have in place the technical digital ID infrastructure that could be repurposed for a vaccine passport system. This brings us to our discussion today, which will focus on the socio-technical challenges of designing and building such schemes. Now, for you non-STS scholars in the room, and I include myself in this, by socio-technical, we mean both the social and technical factors that make up and influence the technology. To borrow an example from my colleague Aidan Pepin, a car, for example, is an assemblage of wheels, engines, steel, but also a driver, the rules of the road, car safety laws, and sleek adverts featuring hip dads driving off into a sunset somewhere in the Arctic. I hesitate to think what the equivalent of a vaccine passport ad might entail, but I'll leave that to your collective imagination. In today's session, we'll look at questions such as what practical considerations government should be thinking about in designing these systems beyond the technical specifications, what technical design decisions can and should be made around security, authentication, identity linkage, interoperability, 
data sharing and input data? And does the creation of vaccine passport systems inevitably mean a greater embedding of digital identity systems for better or worse? To help us dive into these questions, we're joined today by three distinguished guests, Lord James O'Shaughnessy, conservative member of the House of Lords and a health minister from 2016 to 2018. Carmela Troncoso, assistant professor of security and privacy engineering lab at the Ecole Polytechnique Federal de Lausanne. And Rajit Singh, a researcher at Data and Society on the AI on the Ground initiative. I wanna thank you all so much for joining us today. And I'd like to start by turning to James. Given the announcements from this week, this week from the UK government, we'd love to hear about the practical considerations the government will be thinking about when it comes to the review of these technologies. Thank you, Andrew, um, and thank you so much for the invitation to be a part of this event today. Um, and the first thing I wanted to do, and I'm sure everyone who's listening to this event has looked at the Ada Lovelace interim report on digital vaccine passports that was published last week, but it really is very good. Uh, and I, I endorse the approach that it has, has taken. Um, the Institute has been doing excellent work actually throughout COVID. We, the, the work on the digital tracing app, for example, um, uh, in April last year was was very influential and at, at that time I was uh, back in the department having been called back in like many people were to to help with the Covid response um, and so your the, the, the work you're doing on vaccine passports now I'm sure will be just as influential but you said um, uh, Andrew in your opening that this is this is obviously a real and live debate um, and people shouldn't underestimate the importance of the review that was announced into the use of passports after some vacillation, I think, from government ministers about whether this was or wasn't something um, that they were looking into. Um, a review, proper review is now taking place. It's been led by Michael Gove. Um, he is, as many people will know, a highly influential uh, member of the cabinet. So this is a very serious uh, topic of discussion in the UK, as well as being obviously um you know on the agenda from everyone from the who downwards and in most uh national governments at the moment it's actually been a talking point for a lot longer than that um if we reverse rewind for nearly a year back to march april last year the discussion then was of course about immunity passports when we didn't have an antibody test um available to understand how many people might have had this disease there were wildly differing estimates about what might be the case um, and there was talk about immunity passports um or risk passports at the time um and it primarily didn't happen for the same reason that you have concluded that the um case for vaccine passports isn't there now which is that we don't have yet the immunity data um uh, that, that attends to people who have had um the vaccines we do have a better sense now of course of the immunity and transmission risk of people who have had the disease but this is still uh, a work in progress but this is uh, anyway the, the point is there is some history to this and uh, it's germane for our discussion today um so uh, i thought what would be helpful um given i'm a, a policy maker and an, an ex-minister i'm very much on the social and not the technical aspects of um our discussion today but i thought what might be helpful would be to, to bring some of that um, experience to bear and into the discussion and give you an example I think about how the sort of thought processes within government will be will be going um, uh, particularly in, in case of this this review and some of the key issues that will be under consideration I'm sure that the um, the audience today will have lots of opinions on them the, the first one is the obvious one but it doesn't always get asked which is what do we want to do with these passports um, are they a, a solution in search of a problem? And um, what is it that we actually want them, what purpose do we want them to perform? Um, is it to um, certify or, or uh, somehow validate individuals' risk, um, risks to the wider community through transmission, both? Do we also want them to drive, as has been suggested, to drive a vaccine uptake as being a sort of badge of honor, perhaps, or, or um, some sort of validation for people undertaking this? But for getting clarity about what we want out of these passports is obviously the first step. The second is then understanding what it is exactly that we are certifying. The obvious thing is vaccines, and you know, we have the equivalent and, and often gets talked about, which is the yellow fever certificate. Is that what we're doing? Are we are, are we creating a new yellow fever certificate for COVID? But what about people who can't have the vaccine because they're immunocompromised, for example, or or, or pregnant, or children, or other reasons? Um, is vaccination 
uh, the right thing to to, to, to to be validating or is it something else? Is it immunity? Is it risk? Bearing in mind that if you're under the age of 20, the risk of death is, is virtually zero. Um, is it your test status? Again, you know, th these are all valid and it might be that what we want is something that does more than one thing. The vaccination might be where we start, but actually what we're trying to do is build up a a risk profile of an individual, risk to self, risk to others, that can have multiple factors and might also rely on different data points. Um, for example, the kind of data points that you would need access to someone's medical record in order to to, to, to be and, and uh, confidential personal information about them, like their age or where they live or what their job is, because clearly these are going to be risk factors as well. The big difference if you work on your own uh, in the attic of your house here or if you are um, uh, uh, active in a care home and uh, that's uh, just as important probably as your age or your weight or other factors. So being clear about what it is that you want these passports to achieve up front and what we're certifying really matters and are not straightforward um, to do. I think there are then some sort of practical issues that then once you've kind of made your decision about what it is you're trying to do, trying to achieve, some vital practical issues, which are, again, like all these things, they are complex. The, the first and obvious one, I think, is the equalities issue. It's been quite well discussed, particularly if vaccination um, uh, vaccinations are not taken up equally amongst all groups, or indeed not even offered yet to all groups. So it's, it's not just the obvious ones about ethnicity, or as I said, people who can't take the vaccine for whatever reasons, but also um, things like age and gender, bearing in mind that there is a gender distribution of the kind of roles of people who have um, in, in health and care, for example, uh, industries. So um, you know, the, the 2010 equality legislation in the UK is very influential on all factors of public policy and will um, probably be the primary um, consideration when thinking about implementation. The second is uh, and these are not in order, by the way, particularly, but, 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 but these are some of the big ones. The second, I think, is what would be the impact on vaccine uptake of having such passports? Um, we actually have in the UK, um, as people may be aware, I mean, an astonishingly high uptake so far, far of these vaccines. And that has been, um, uh, that's very varied, as, as, as people will know, across, across the world. But in the UK, at any rate, um, we have had high uptake. Do you risk validating or um, somehow valorizing anti-vaxxers who refuse to um, comply by formalizing or, or uh, as a sort of soft, a soft compulsion um, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the uptake of the vaccines? And, and so it could actually have a negative impact when uh, on, on the uptake levels that we've had so far. The third is, you know, this is a spectrum of potential use cases. It seems to me completely obvious that you would end up having such a system for international travel. Um, and completely obvious that you would never have such a system for going into an outdoor public space like a park. But there are a lot of steps in, 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 in intervening. What are the edge cases? Is it private employment? Because bearing in mind under health and safety legislation, employers have a responsibility to maintain a healthy workplace. Um, those are private spaces. What about semi-public, uh, semi-private, if you like, the spaces like um, pubs, restaurants, uh, theatres, event spaces, and so on? Um, understanding the use case and indeed where is the edge? Where, where do people feel comfortable legally, ethically, but also practically at the edge cases, I think is going to be very important and probably to start cautiously. And then the, 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 the final uh, sort of consideration is, is the sort of health versus economic benefits of, of doing this. And um, it's been one of the di most difficult parts of this whole process, I think, for governments is to weigh the health and economic benefits. And of course, we have a whole field of health economics to do it, but it is struggled to, to have a, an impact and influence during the comfort of the pandemic. And then just finally there, I think there are some sort of practical things which I would mention. The first is who is responsible for pr producing these, uh, these passports? Is this a primarily a public sector? exercise bearing in mind that perhaps the public sector doesn't always do IT projects very well. Is it a private sector um, initiative that is regulated? And how do you have um, obviously convergence in, in internationally bearing in mind that, that that will be an important part of getting back to normal? And the final point, and this really comes full circle to what um, the Institute said last week, is how you go about deciding these questions with the public massively matters. We know people are very sensitive about these issues. They are sensitive about data issues in general, but these ones in specific. Having a public, deliberative, engaged approach 
that is iterative and not your classic government's decided and then it's now going to consult but it's made its mind up is going to be really important so there needs to be a very broad conversation i would have thought with populations across the you know in, in, in jurisdictions across the world to make sure that we get to the right answers or something like the right answers in each of those jurisdictions and that is as important as anything else Thank you so much, James. Those are some fantastic, fantastic points there around what the intended uses of these systems are, the kinds of challenges they bring up for government. And particularly, I think your point around uh, who is actually certifying is very key, um, which I think has some very important implications for how these systems are designed and deployed. And that actually leads to a nice segue to Carmela. Um, Carmela, I, I'd love to speak with you a bit, or hear, hear your thoughts you say around um, some of the technical choices, challenges, and the viability of building vaccine passport and COVID test systems. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, so good computer science, I do have slides, which I hope now you can see. Yep, cool. Great. So I want to talk a little bit about when we talk about digital certificates from a technical perspective, what are the misconceptions and the problems I see when people try to imagine and to, to encode an image of that, how it could be, how do I perceive it and what things I think they can be done or they cannot be done. Uh, let me clarify that all of this talk is going to be about digital version of certificates. Uh, I think that paper-based certificates are a completely different conversation. We cannot conflate them both. And also that I'm here to speak in as an individual, uh, given my expertise, and I don't represent my institution or any of the bodies I belong to. So with this said, uh, we had Andrew at the beginning saying like early this week we had this COVID response, and we already heard in the previous from the previous speaker that it is very important to consider the ethical, the privacy, the legal, the operational aspects of of, of these certificates. And when I hear all of these things, people really focus on the certificates. When they are digital, we mostly imagine they are going to come on an app, they're going to come on a QR code version or a barcode version or something that is machine readable. And then we kind of focus on things like, are the certificates ethical? Are the certificates, right? And typically, like concerns that come, the harms is like, is privacy covered? Is discrimination covered? Are there going to be some uh, freedoms, uh, uh, limitations, you know, our individual rights? What about ethics? And the first thing I want to point out is that when we think about this from a technical perspective with deploying infrastructure, at the end of the day, all of these aspects are many sides of the same coin. It's not that we want things to, I mean, of course we do with these to be private and ethical, but the goal tends not to be to be private. The goal tends to be that we really don't want technology and infrastructure to become mechanisms that exacerbate uh, difference in power and enable abuse by these new infrastructures and new control measures. And this happened with privacy, right? And, and I was very much involved in the design of contact tracing apps and we were behind the, the, the idea that this had to be privacy preserving, but privacy was not the goal. Privacy was our means towards actually avoid any abuse prevention and also ensure that this technology could maintain democratic values that goes beyond individual rights, beyond the fact that yes, the privacy of this particular individual is, is maintained, but also that communities cannot be profiled, communities cannot be controlled, that um, uh, the whole of the society does not change, that there were structures in which we kind of have these individual rights, do not change because now there is new technology that changes the framework in which we live, in which we move, in which we interact with others, because now there is a new big brother looking. But it's not about privacy from the big brother, it's about how we want to protect ourselves from what can happen after the brother is there. And the same happens with discrimination or other freedom limitations, like we don't want the consequences of those. But limiting them is, is not the goal. So it's very important to understand the harms. And once we understand this, it's also important to understand that all of these harms, the harms that come from not having privacy, not having ethics, not having discrimination prevention, are not actually in the certificates. All of them actually are in the verification part and what the, verific the verifier will do with this. Once they verify we're actually vaccinated or uh, before we had uh, that we are immune, that we have a test or whatever, we, we can 
uh, kind of claim with this with this tool the problem and the harms will stem on how these are used are they used to not give me a job are they used to not allow me to go to another country are they used to not allow me to leave my home like depending on these things so trying to look only at the certificates and limit this conversation to very small is, is actually making us lose a little bit uh, the goal here because it is very important to realize that because the harm system from the verifier and the verifier is not really a part of the certificate it's not even a part of the protocol which with the certificate with the call to the verifier we have now a lot of obsession of what will be in the certificate will it have names will it have my medical records what will i show to the verifier when i show my certificate look even if we have a yes or no that does not mean that we're gonna impede any of the harms so that means that kind of the some of the tricks i'm going to call them tricks or, or lack of a better word here that we did for the contact tracing apps to minimize data in order to avoid all of those harms do not apply most of the time or all of the time to immunity certificates because it is not about what the certificate reveals it's about the fact having a yes or a no can create harms that technology cannot avoid at any point in the design. And then once we say this, okay, say, okay, it's not only the certificates, very fine matters. And then I also observe a lot that people then believe that this is the system. I just do things, verifier and thing. I just have my certificate, I go, I put it on a place, it is verified and that is. But the system, the overall system is much bigger. It contains hospitals and there's the people that actually put vaccines that they may not be on a hospital they may be on a track that goes to places they may be on an emergency hospital or uh, we saw in israel people in garages right getting their jobs we also have and uh, andrew mentioned it before an identity structure that may need to be built also because at the end of the day if i have a certificate it needs to be for me if i have the certificate of my wife and i can be showing it around then this does not really fulfill the role so we're going to have to have some kind of identities and some kind of mesh uh, of matching them and now because we want this to be digital that also means that we're going to need another bunch of infrastructure that goes around besides the phones because now hospitals and the people that put the apps and these ids they're going to be servers that need to store information that need to communicate with each other these people here um, that put the jobs are going to have to have a way of telling this digital infrastructure that Carmela now got the job and now she's good to go. And for all of this to trust, we're going to have to build more infrastructure behind that allows the system to be trustworthy. And I'm just put here uh, one of the first images that come on the internet when you say how to build a public key infrastructure. The main, I mean, you don't need to remember the name, but this is one of the main tools that people claim is going to solve this trustworthy problem. And you can already see in my slide that this is not a simple infrastructure. We're going to have roots and subordinates. We're going to have people that have signatures and people that validate. We're going to need revocation. We're going to need policies. Like this is a whole ecosystem. And this idea of a certificate and verifier is just a zoom in that does not allow us to see all of the problems. And when we actually see this complex infrastructure, one of the first consequences is that when we build something complex, security becomes hard. One of the first principles of security engineering is called economy of mechanism. Also, keep it simple. We know how to secure simple things because we can understand that the moment that you have something so complicated with a lot of actors, like it becomes hard. And in this sense, trustworthiness that we said, okay, if you digitalize everything, you're going to have certificates, you're going to have all of this public key infrastructure, cryptography is going to solve the problem. But the thing is that the, the trustworthiness will still depend on trusting the people, the people that put the job and that can actually tell the system that it was Carmela that was in there and that Carmela who got a job. And if we cannot trust these people, and now we think about having a global infrastructure in which we're going to have doctors, engineers handle systems, um, nurses all across the globe, can we really say that we're going to be able to trust all of them to never lie, to not be corrupted, to not be coerced and to have this thing? Will actually we have the level of trustworthiness that in theory we are told that we need digitalization for and certificates need to be digital because otherwise fraud is unstoppable. Is it actually stoppable in digital systems? 
A concern with number two is that the operation will rely on the health services digital capabilities. And again, speaking from my experience in deploying contact tracing apps, health services are not always ready. Their processes are not digital. The fact that we imagine that these people that now are going to take vaccines and go on a track to, to uh, a village in the middle of the mountains in Switzerland and are going to put this, and there they're going to have a device that is connected to this infrastructure is going to be reliable. It's kind of not really something that uh, matches reality. Those systems are not there. And if we think now, okay, then they will just take notes and when they go back to the office, put the notes on a, on a computer, then we're back really on a paper-based system. So we're trying to digitalize things, but if we not only need to digitalize how the certificate is shown, if we're not able to purely digitalize the end-to-end -end process, this thing is just not giving us something much, much better than what we have now. And the consequence number three is that if we are to have this certificate for COVID-19, it needs to be fast, right? In six months, we expect to have 80 to 90 percent of populations vaccinated. Do we need a passport then? And what the idea is that in order to one of the con uh, of the considerations before was economic benefit. For that, it needs to happen very fast. Now, if we need to deploy at that speed, first, I do not believe personally that we can have a democratic deployment. It's going to be fast and it's going to be imposed. I very much like what the previous speaker said about we need to have a conversation, but sorry, the conversation is not happening, right? We have bodies imposing this thing. Andrew said in his introduction, the UK is moving, Spain is moving, so Spain, Switzerland seems to be moving, Greece is moving. So what is that conversation? Speed does not allow a good informed debate with the public. And also because we need the speed and because of what I said in the point two, that we don't have the infrastructures, private actors will be involved because those are the ones that can deploy at a large speed. And that will create dependencies, dependencies that be the ones that we see in the contact tracing apps. For fastness of deployment and for good interoperability, Google and Apple came into the game and now we depend on them for almost everything. And that will happen as well in these certificates and it's a very dangerous step to go. Because once we put an infrastructure there, now they are in the system, we depend on them, and they had an entry on the health services that maybe we have been trying to avoid for a long, long time. So the question with all of this is that uh, given that this system is very complex, there is a high risk that we end up with an infrastructure that is very entrenched in the uh, world's health system that does not solve the problem, because of trustworthiness or because of lack of pure di digitalization and standardization across the value chain from the jack to the border, but it still can be reused for anything by the public and the private sector. Already in the previous talk, we were uh, told about 10 different uses, right? We we're like, oh no, this is going to be for vaccination, but now it can also be apparently used to prove what my job is. It could also be used by my employer or by my future employer to ask me, did you have a disease in the last six months that got you, I don't know, more than one week um, uh, out of job or uh, to stay at home. And we can build all of these things in a very privacy preserving way, going again to the narrow vision of the certificate and say, oh no, the certificate is ethical, but that it still can't prevent me from having a job. What if it's uh, what I have to prove or other things to enter on a bar? Like once we create this just no machine, there is no way that we can limit the function creep other than trusting that an infrastructure that is built there where the private sector has an incentive for is going to just be kept for this little thing. But digital infrastructures are like roads. Once we build them, they are there and probably cars will be running on them because you have to do an investment. So it is very weird that they are just going to be left alone. And last thing is that we're going to say, okay, but we can govern. Well, you know, infrastructures are going to be interoperable, are going to be international, especially if we have big private multinational actors. And it is very hard to have international governance that covers all of this and that ensures us that uh, this will be controlled. Already we have questions about who should do it inside the country, who should do it when we are talking about uh, international, um, international coverage. And just to say at the end, all of these infrastructures, did not even appear or are to be seen in the kind of plans of the government. And if we don't control the infrastructure, if we don't reason about them, if we don't reason what can happen once the infrastructure is there, 
all of the rest of the discussion is futile because we have not really tackled the core problem that the certificates will bring. Thank you so much, Carmela. Uh, some excellent points in there about um, the concept of privacy and the notion of the verifier is perhaps the, the, the key part. I really like the, the, that distinction between contact tracing apps and um, vaccine passport schemes. I'd love to come back to that in the questions. And I, and I think their points around infrastructure are, are, are extremely relevant. Um, uh, what are we building and, and how can it be repurposed? And thank you for returning to my car metaphor. I, I, I always appreciate that. Um, Ranji, I want to turn to you now um, to take up this point around infrastructure. And I'd be great to, to if you could speak for a few, few moments um, about uh, the ways in which the logistics of digital ID and vaccine distribution are working in India. And before you start, I just want to quickly um, flag, if you do have questions and that you'd like to ask, we're going to be moving to a Q&A um, session after Ranjit finishes. Please feel free to ask them in the Q&A section, um, just so I'm not having to go between the Q&A and, and the, uh, the chat. Um, but with that, Ranjit, I will pass it to you. Oh, Ranjit, I think you might be muted. So uh, I'm going to use my experience with basically studying India's biometric-based national identification infrastructure to think about some of these intricacies of how they are connected with vaccine certificates. Um, so I think to put it simply, the relationship between digital IDs and vaccine certificate at its face is functional, right? So when a person receives a vaccine or vaccines, given that the current regime of preferred vaccines come in two separately administered doses spread over time, there needs to be a record of the vaccine. When and where did a, vac did a person receive the vaccine? Which vaccine did they receive? The schedule for the next dose, et cetera. So there needs to be a record of the vaccination, which should ideally be connected with some data about the person who receives them. So generally connecting vaccination data with some sort of national or digital ID is useful or imagined to be useful in two ways. First, it affords accuracy in tracking who has received the vaccine and who has not, which allows for emerging forms of data-driven policy readjustments in distributing vaccinations across the country. And second, it provides for a way for countries to validate a citizen's claim that they are in fact vaccinated. This can be done through paper-based forms or through digital apps. Uh, paper, as the argument goes, is prone to alteration and forgery. So digital applications are considered more promising in establishing ongoing and continuous trails of verification. An immunity passport along these lines, technically, it's just a record that certifies that a person who wishes to travel from place A to place B is vaccinated. This is not new and we are quite familiar with the yellow card, a paper-based international certification for uh, vaccinations. Uh, it is not surprising that one of the collaborative efforts between the WHO and Estonia for building immunity passports is called the smart yellow card. However, what is more interesting is how these efforts are oriented towards a global framework rather than a country specific framework to manage the rollout of vaccinations at scale. Vaccine distribution will move through stages of scarcity and shortage, which we are currently experiencing. And that's why we have all these ways of deciding who gets vaccine and who doesn't to you know, uh, the next phase, which would be adequate availability of vaccinations to finally vaccine surplus. Facilitating international travel, I would argue, is only a small part of this puzzle. Every country needs to figure out their own vaccine rollout procedures. It is in this context, I believe, that distribution of vaccine certificates can be used and is used in India as an organizational principle for managing the entire rollout. And I'll show how it works. So India is currently developing its own digital infrastructure for verifiable open credentialing in short called DIVOC. Notice the wordplay here, it's COVID in reverse. Uh, DIVOC is a newer technical intervention when compared to the much debated COVID application, which is currently also being revamped in the country. While development of COVID was always oriented towards vaccine rollouts in India, DIVOC is oriented towards creating a more modular plug and play digital uh, platform that can be used by any country in the world to organize their vaccine rollouts. Of course, since these platforms are being built in India, they often invoke the challenges of orchestrating the rollout of the first ever adult vaccination program in the country. So whether it is digital IDs or it is vaccinations, the primary challenge in organizing them is scale. 
As the designers of India's biometric-based digital ID, Aadhaar, which translates uh, to foundation in English, put it, vaccine rollouts face the same challenge of scale as organizing enrollment into Aadhaar. Aadhaar is a unique 12-digit number assigned to every enrolled Indian resident based on collection of their biometric data, their 10 fingerprints, two iris scans, uh, and facial photograph, and their demographic data, which is minimum. Uh, it only collects name, age, gender, and address. And the argument is that getting a vaccine, just like collection of fingerprints, literally requires the physical presence of the entire Indian population of 1.3 billion people at designated places or facilities or camps. The challenge of scale is in fact even bigger for the vaccines, which is delivered in two doses. You have to do the whole exercise twice. So quite predictably, Aadhaar's designers, who have also played a cru crucial role in developing Diabol, have extensively used their experiences with designing Aadhaar enrollment to talk about planning the rollout of vaccinations. Their fundament fundamental message is that India needs a system that at its peak can support 10 million vaccinations a day. This requires a digital platform, a digital spine of sorts, that orchestrates organizational logistics of the vaccine rollout, which would even eventually involve, first, diverse supply chains of different vaccines. So every approved vaccine will have its own supply logistics. Second, diverse distribution channels. So currently the government is distributing vaccines at designated centers. But the expectation is that private agencies will get the permission to vaccinate as 2021 progresses. Third, diverse personnel who must be certified and trained in providing vaccinations. So by estimates, India would need about 200,000 to 300,000 personnel to achieve the scale of 10 million vaccinations a day. Fourth, diverse methods of paying for the vaccines, including government subsidies, employing, employers paying for their employees, health insurance, personal funds, and so on. Fifth, diverse ways of distributing vaccine certification itself. So everyone who has been vaccinated is, is, will get a QR code based electronic certificate on their smartphone with the option to download a paper copy so that every person gets the same experience and the same information is recorded about them. And sixth and finally, diverse ways of collecting feedback on the vaccination process itself from people who received a dose to figure out which facilities are performing better, which vaccines are performing better, what are their side effects, etc. So as you can see, rolling out vaccinations is actually a far more complicated en endeavor than enrolling people into a digital ID system. Now, some parts of this process can be controlled more effectively through a digital platform as opposed to others. So for example, the logistical supply chain of vaccine approval and procurement and training of personnel and capacity building to deliver the vaccinations are both important parts of this puzzle. But DIVOC as a platform specifically focuses more exclusively on the organization of the rollout of vaccines, certification of the process of receiving the vaccine and feedback on the process. Now, keeping these aspects of the process distinct from each other is also necessary because that's what allows for a kind of plug and play architecture, as I mentioned earlier, where existing ecosystem of organizations involved in vaccine procurement and training personnel can plug into the infrastructure as a platform rather than the platform actively trying to integrate all of these aspects of vaccine delivery together. So now uh, you can imagine this platform uh, that India is currently building for vaccine distribution as an hour class. At the waist of this hour class is the vaccine certificate and the QR code attached to it. Below the waist is vaccine distribution facilities and places where vaccines are basically uh, you know, accessed by people. And above the waste is any organization that needs vaccine certificate in organizing its services, whether it is airports, whether it is employees, whatever it might be, employers, for example. So this organization enables the vaccine certificate to be seamlessly integrated into any service that may require it or any medical facility that provides vaccinations. It orchestrates the rollout of vaccines by continuously evaluating performance of facilities, personnel, and geographic areas in the country. DIVOC, for example, uses the process of issuing vaccine certification to one, build registries of different facilities, vaccines, personnel, and vaccination programs. So the same platform can be used to distribute COVID vaccines or distribute polio vaccines. It really doesn't matter. You know. Uh, it uses analytics and telemetry to evaluate performance uh, of these medical facilities. So how many people have been vaccinated and where, 
what is the rate of vaccination, what is the early warning signs uh, for uh, you know, the side effects of vaccinations, and then finally detection of fraud and forgery. And finally, it uses feedback from people who receive the vaccine to make data-driven policy readjustments in uh, vaccine distribution itself. So while these plans are highly effective in achieving scale, and they kind of have worked in the way in which Aadhaar enrollment has worked out in the last 10 years in India, uh, they come with their own challenges of making these plans work on the ground. Uh, the simplest example here would be how Aadhaar enrollment was organized by the government to be free for residents. But enrollment agencies often charge money for enrollment. This was a point of deep contention uh, with quite a few agencies being blacklisted for charging money by the Unique Identification Authority of India, which was in charge of implementing Aadhaar. So similarly, while vaccinations can be subsidized by the government or distributed for free, facilities may charge additional money for them. And these forms of mundane corruption are a part and parcel for, of organizing vaccinations at a scale of a country like India. Certainly many forms of such corruption will be captured by the feedback systems incorporated into these platforms. However, without adequate efforts to formalize grievance redressal, apart from the sort of exit service of, uh, on receiving vaccinations, such feedback mechanisms will often and will definitely remain inadequate. So coming back to the relationship between digital IDs and vaccine certificates, the use of the biometric ID Aadhaar is voluntary for access, accessing vaccinations in India. However, vaccinations provided by the government for free or subsidized by the government requires citizens to provide their Aadhaar number. So for many who may not be able to afford the vaccination otherwise, this makes Aadhaar mandatory by extension for receiving vaccinations. Along these lines, another idea that is currently being floated around is to build on the success of direct cash transfers for social assistance through COVID relief programs to organize vaccine distribution. So in these plans, people receiving vaccine pay the market price for them and the cash subsidy amount is transferred by the government directly into the bank account connected to digital IDs of people. In a cash-based vaccine distribution, the complete vaccine supply chain from pharmaceutical companies to customers can be outsourced to a private market. The government can regulate what it's willing to pay for each vaccine instead of investing its own resources in building the infrastructure for vaccine distribution. While this may work to some extent and for some parts of the population, privatization of public infrastructures is often most challenging and exclusionary for communities at the margins. So to conclude, I would say that vaccine certification in, is increasingly being organized using principles that are used to implement digital IDs in India. At the same time, vaccine certifications are being used to reimagine the use of digital IDs in the health sector. In fact, India is using its vaccine distribution project as the groundwork for issuing a unique health ID to citizens. The time-bounded crisis of COVID-19 is a justification for investments into a long-term infrastructure for India's national digital health mission. So digital IDs and vaccine certification have mutually shaped each other in India. While experiences with Aadhaar are currently being used to implement vaccine certificates, the experiences with these cert certificates will be used to implement a unique health ID in the country. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ranjit. That was that was excellent. Uh, it's some really good points about about the, the ways in which the infrastructure uh, uh, is is being currently used, but also the the kind of ways in which it is opening up new um, pathways and forming part of a much larger um, strategy of of, uh, of healthcare plans. I want to um, uh, take us into a Q and A session, and I can see there's some excellent questions in in the the function. Please feel free to add more as we go. But I'd like to start off with one that's kind of again based on this point around infrastructure. Um, I'm curious, does the creation of vaccine passport systems inevitably mean a greater embedding of digital identity systems, or is that a choice? Uh, are there ways to um, technical measures or other kinds of policy levers that can um, build in sort of a time-bound purpose fit uh, uh, intervention that doesn't create this massive infrastructure that would be lasting afterwards? Um, I'll turn first to Carmela, and then it'd be great to hear from James and Ranji on this one. So I think that the answer in theory, and if we had five years of academia on this could be no, we can build a system that separates these two things, putting a lot of crypto and decentralization. The answer in practice is no. It is very hard uh, 
that, that what Ranjit has described does not happen, especially because most of the private sector that is now in this race are actually the digital identity that have been trying to get uh, a use case for the digital identity and finally they have found something where this is useful. So I think that the answer is, is not that it is needed, but my belief is what it is will happen. And especially again, given by the speed and the situation in which we live. Um, Andrew, I think you want ask me to, to, to respond next. Um, well, my, I, this is good, so we're disagreeing, because I think the answer is it doesn't necessarily um, lead to a digital ID, as I think the context of individual countries matters hugely. Um, lots of countries do already have ident legal identification systems. Um, the UK is not one of them. And so there is no responsibility to have uh, an ID. And indeed, this has been a hot political topic for at least two decades. Um, and so I think um, it is possible to divide the two. Uh, it also matters at what stage, I think, of the development of your health services. Um, Rajit gave a very good example about how in a country where not everybody has a unique um, health identifying number, uh, as is the case in, in again in the UK and, and, and other developed nations um that it, it is being used in in a sense to create some sort of universal coverage or understanding about what the population needs are but i think it is it is still a policy choice particularly in those countries as i said that don't have a um a, a statutory id system what but having said that it is going to be hard to resist you would have thought having if there are vaccine or whatever passports we call them and I think vaccine passport is, is probably the wrong way to do it. It is ultimately about risk. The risk for this disease is going to um, uh, maintain for a while. And therefore, will it be hard? Will it be hard to resist the temptation to merge these into single forms? ID? I think there will be huge pressure because um, from a government from government's point of view, or at least from officials point of view, they tend to be quite keen on these things because they tidy up what is otherwise a messy network of other ID systems that exist. Can I, can I come back to this? Or do you wanna, so the question here is that in order to show a certificate again and for it to be useful, it needs to be bound to myself. I need to be proven. I need to be able to prove that I am the one that got the vaccine. Otherwise, this is, this is useless, right? So now there are two questions. Either I have a digital identity that is bound one way or another, or I don't have a digital identity, I have my passport, school this paper but i need to have a way for the person to bind it there ways to do this is to put on the certificate my uh, passport number uh, my passport number to put on the certificate my name something that can be used to bind but that means that even though i didn't create a digital identity system i have now created the digital identity which is the vaccine certification that actually has my name and it has it's maybe even worse because now the certificate has taken over a new role which is to give an identity to people and that's the the, the the duality here that is very hard to come out that i think that the points that the Ranjit and how adhar and the vaccination system in india are being interleaved comes from the fact that this binding is impossible to remove mm. for the system to be functional and therefore we end up on one of the two sides but i'm happy to hear Ranjit's view on this and if that kind of matches your experience yeah, please, Ranjit. I think there are two aspects to this problem that I have found to be particularly useful in thinking about the relationship of what digital IDs can potentially do. There's one aspect of this question is how centralized they are uh, and how, you know, they kind of, you know, are centered on this notion of uh, collecting information and putting them to all together in one place, which kind of creates a threat of privacy and surveillance challenges. One of the ways in which Aadhaar designers tried to actually address this problem was to basically articulate a way of creating federated identities where uh, a unique identifier might be used across data sets to basically uniquely identify records that are uh, that belong to people, right? So that was a way of basically figuring out which of these records in these other databases, which was not Aadhaar, which is kind of connected to biometrics and hence it is unique. Um, which of these records are fraud and ghosts and which of these records are unique and belong to people. Uh, and in creating those links, one of the things that they were trying to do 
was to limit how our transaction histories are recorded. So uh, if I do, you know, the argument primarily being, if I do not remember, uh, you know, where you have used your digital ID, then there is no way I can actually impinge on your privacy or, you know, survey you one way or the other. And the example that is generally used for it or the metaphor that is generally used for it is uh, uh, how satellites offer GPS services without actually actively surveilling you. There is the infrastructure that is built on top of GPS, in, uh, you know, as a, as a resource that can be used in order to surveil a person, but the satellite itself cannot be used to do the same thing. So this particular way in which we imagine storage of data becomes one of the central challenges in thinking about how digital IDs kind of become a part of the imagination of how uh, they have these certain forms of function tree. And vaccine certification in that sense is only an extension of a service uh, for you know, uh, the government of India where you know, the imagination is, oh, we already have IDs. We need to ensure vaccinations and we need to ensure that you know, everybody is vaccinated. So the best way of actually doing it would be to actually use the number, uh, the biometric number in order to do it. But at the same time, it also creates these sets of challenges which are kind of centered on there are people in the world who really don't want to use that biometric ID for everything in the world, right? So uh, it kind of then becomes a matter of personal choice. And uh, the government is basically just insisting on, uh, you know, the use of the number if you're availing government subsidies. Otherwise you can basically use or create your own ID. I, I'm wondering a few, a few questions in the chat have brought this question up as well. What if we, do, do digital or sorry, do paper uh, certification schemes offer the same kind of challenges? Does that change the risk calculus um, that, that you described at all? And relatedly, I think the other trend that we're seeing is a shift from vaccine status towards test status. I'm wondering if that is in any way changing the calculus. And, and uh, particularly, I think, Carmela, your point around verifier is, is, I think, the key one that I'm coming back to here. Um, I'm wondering uh, if, if that is in any way changing how you're, you're thinking of the concerns around identity and privacy um, and, and the, the challenges of, of security that you described in your talk. Uh, that we do vaccine or test? No, the problem of this infrastructure is that the infrastructure just allows you to prove claims. For the infrastructure, for the computer, for me as a security and privacy engineer, I'm proving a claim. The content of the claim is irrelevant for the technology. The moment that we create infrastructure and we embed it in the health system, it's going to be able to prove vaccines, tests, jobs, age, weight, anything. Like the infrastructure is there and the infrastructure itself does not know what it's doing. It's only how we use it. But we just have created the road for any of these vehicles to go and happen. And we're normalizing the idea that this can be done and that it is okay to ask people for formally <laughs> proving their claims about their health, about their past. And as I said before, we can have, I maybe I'm now asking to prove that I didn't have a divorce, like whatever. Once we have a claim prover from a technical perspective, there is no limit. So yeah, it's quite, it's quite interesting. I, and uh, I guess, uh, the, a related question was on physical checks, physical passport systems. You know, like we, we think about the, I think Renji, you mentioned the um, yellow fever car, which is a physical passport that you carry with you. Um, do you see, Renji, like similar concerns around infrastructure and around privacy raised, raising up with those kinds of schemes? Well, so, you know, India currently is also in the process of building its own data protection regime, and it's not in place. So uh, one of the, one of the big challenges in actually implementing all of these digital infrastructures without this particular, uh, you know, regulatory regime around it kind of, uh, you know, raises the kind of, uh, you know, challenges that Carmela has brought out in a way, right? That, you know, you can use it for a variety of different ways. It has this massive function rate that can increasingly go forward in a variety of different ways. So one of the things that is kind of really necessary in this process is to basically then figure out what are the places where we can use these systems and what are the places where you can't use these systems? So uh, a classic example here would be, uh, you know, the Supreme Court of India in deciding on the use of Aadhaar uh, in 2018 decided that, you know, uh, its access, access to the number and its use would be restricted only for government services and should not be used by private companies at all, which was an interesting intervention. But, you know, the government had kind of intervened after that and, uh, you know, made it accessible to uh, telecom companies to uh, banks so that they can use the number in order to basically do their unique identification services. 
So uh, the challenge here primarily is uh, of uh, regulating use. And Carmel is absolutely right on, the, on that front uh, in terms of deciding that these are the places where this is necessary and these are the places where you know, it might not be necessary. So what is the legitimate purpose? As uh, James was pointing out initially, what, how do we define a legitimate way in which we can use these systems and what, what seems to be illegitimate? Every country has its own culture around it and they will decide their own ways in which they uh, choose what, this, what the threshold of legitimacy here is. Uh, Carmela raised a really good point in her, in her uh, talk about the challenges that the more people you have in the system, the more kinds of trust and security issues come up because you have to trust essentially more people in the system to, to use it in non-abusive ways. James, there's a, a, good, a good question from an anonymous, an anonymous viewer, I can never say that word, um, uh, who's a theater producer, who's very concerned that the sector, their sector will be the face of health passports and new system identity checks. Um, the risk within a theater is driven by infection rate within the community at the time with mitigation measures already in place, but keeping in mind the potential for discrimination, unknown impact on social behavior, and a less than perfect system to implementation by disparate and loosely regulated set of ticket sellers, agents, and venue operators, what real world health outcome would COVID status certification or a green light test actually achieve other than COVID security theater? Yeah, well, that's a terrific question. Um, and if I, I, I want to come to that answer, and I'm also, forgive me, I'm, I'm gonna have to drop off in a couple of minutes, but, um, by just addressing actually the first point, which is you asked about paper cards. Put it differently, do we want to revert to having paper-based health records? No, of, of course, we. I mean, that, there, there is almost no benefit I can think of that would come from doing that. We want to, for people to have um, absolutely as comprehensive as possible records about their health care. That just happens to include COVID. And that should have, you know, individual agency and control. It should have appropriate data protection and sharing protocols. And it should include a range of data, not just publicly owned data. And of course, ideally, what that should also, such a, a health record should do, personal health record should do, is provide specific health advice to me to reduce my risks, whether that's developing cancer, cardiovascular disease, or for that matter, COVID, right? That is one thing. And I would have thought we want as much COVID information in that just as we would about any other health episodes or, or risks that we have. Of course, the in th interesting thing about infectious diseases is that there is a communal dimension to this, which is not true of other illnesses. Then there is a question of what, if anything, does that unlock? Um, and that I think is where the real discussion needs to happen. And as Ranjit said, that is gonna be culturally sensitive to different contexts, uh, as well as the technical um, challenges that underpin that, that, that Carmela had described. I think events are a really interesting use case. I'm actually talking to a group who are working with the events industry um, and about to put on a, a clinical trial and those will also become a, a possible potentially in the UK from, um, from April onwards. They are not actually interested in keeping people out on the basis of their COVID status, be that vaccine, immunity, testing, whatever. They are interested in understanding what their audience and um, their status is um, and then making a judgment about the risk of uh, of holding those events and, and, and the ways in which people move around in them and, and all the rest of it accordingly. And then subsequently making a judgment about what effectively whether they are safe and at what levels of community transmission they are safe to happen. So I think again, that is quite another interesting way of looking at it. Is that not that, not that these, this kind of information is used to prevent people going in and out. I think international travel inevitably will be an exception, but is used in order to, for somebody, whether it is the theater production company or an employer or somebody to have a proper understanding about the level of risk. And then if risk gets too high by whatever judgment for their community um, to, to have some interventional tools now that is that that is a very different conception of that. That's not vaccine passports at all. That's vaccine status or COVID health status. And by the way, that could, it could be as true of yellow fever as it is of flu, or as it is of anything. And that strikes me again as being quite a useful thing that we would want to be able to understand uh, going forward. You know, once we're the other side of the pandemic, however long that will take. Um, and I will stop here and, and, and say thank you and goodbye and uh, thank you again for the invitation. Uh, thank you very much, James. Uh, with that, actually, that is taking us to the hour. And unfortunately, as we, as every time we do these events, you can just continue going on and on and on because this is such a thorny, challenging and deeply uh, um, interesting issue. 
Um, and again, all the more urgent. Um, for those questions that we didn't quite get to, I am so sorry. Again, time constraints are, are the pain, but please do follow us on, on Twitter and continue the conversation there. Um, uh, all of our panelists are on Twitter, so they um, hopefully can engage uh, in that format. Um, we will be doing, um, I believe, one more event in this series, uh, more details to come on that. And uh, please do look forward to the Ada, Insti the Ada Lovelace Institute uh, report, which will be released in the next few weeks, next month, I believe, um, that gets into some of the more thorny details that we have uh, found in our open call for evidence. I want to thank our guests, Ranji Singh and Carmela Troncoso, once again for joining us. And thank all of you for participating today. Um, take care and have a lovely day. <laughs>